Well, good morning, good morning. <clears throat> Acts chapter 9. That's a fun one, boy. This is a really fun one. I love this one. The other day, um, I was watching a, a little video of... Oh, Brittany. What's that uh, comedian's name with the blonde hair, Christian guy? Yeah, she says I'd know it if you didn't ask me. Tim Hawkins, yeah. Anybody ever seen Tim Hawkins? Dude is hilarious, man. And uh, he was he was talking about his wife and how he was really blessed with a, a great wife, as was I, um, as I am. And he said, but not everybody's blessed with a, a great wife. And he's like, sorry. But then he goes on and he starts talking about Job. And he says, y'all know anything about Job's wife? And he says, Satan took everything from Job. Took everything. His kids, his home, his livestock, his health. He was even covered in boils and sores. But his wife didn't die. And he's like, that's something to think about, isn't it? <laughs> he says, somebody's over there like, hey, Satan, Job's wife is still alive. And Satan says, ha, 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 I know. Just wait. I know what I'm doing. But fortunately, I was blessed with a very amazing, awesome wife. So thank God for all the awesome wives in the room. Today we're talking about Soul's conversion is really where Acts chapter 9 kicks off. In uh, Acts chapter 8, we had the persecution and how it scattered the believers. We had Philip preaching in Samaria and how he goes and speaks with the eunuch, you know, that was cruising down the road. Rod did an awesome job last week uh, filling us in on all that. And then... We come to Acts chapter 9, and, and Saul, who later becomes Paul, is kind of sprinkled in Acts chapter 8, the ending of Acts chapter 7, we see that he's, he's standing there at um, Stephen's murder, and it says that he was a young man, and they were everybody that took part in killing Stephen were laying their coats at his feet, and then a little bit later in Acts chapter 8, it talks about how, um, how Saul, he was actually going through and imprisoning and, and taking anybody that believed in the faith, taking them to Jerusalem to actually be punished for believing in Jesus as the Messiah. And so now we come to Acts chapter 9, and it says, Meanwhile... Saul was uttering threats, some versions say breathing threats. He was uttering threats with every breath and was eager to kill the Lord's followers. So he went to the high priest, he requested letters addressed to the synagogues in Damascus, asking for their cooperation in arrest of any followers of the way he found there. He waited, he wanted to bring them, both men and women, back to Jerusalem in chains. So, it was Acts chapter 8, where he was, he was expanding his work, and now he's going into Damascus. Damascus is about 130 miles northeast of Jerusalem, and in, in that time, it would have been about a six days journey. Okay, they couldn't just jump on a train, a plane, or any cars. It took quite a while to get there, so 130 miles, roughly six days. But look at Paul, like, look at this guy's demeanor right now. And we're going to watch how his demeanor drastically changes after he encounters Jesus face to face. Right now, he's, he's angry, he's, he's violent, and he's absolutely convinced that he's righteous and what he's doing is righteous. Have you ever, um, have you ever been on this path that you felt like was completely right and justified? You were justified to feel this way. You were justified to act this way. 
And then later, God reveals to you in whatever way He sees fit and shows you that you weren't justified to act like that at all. Yes, maybe you were taught that this was the right way to handle things. Maybe you were, uh, you were brought up to see people reacting and responding to things in a specific way. And so that's how you reacted and responded. But then all of a sudden, Jesus flips the switch on you and you're like, whoa, I was wrong. I have. I've been in that place. But Paul, he wasn't seeking Jesus when Jesus sought him. Just like most of us weren't seeking Jesus whenever he came to find us. Maybe you feel like that, that well, actually, no, I did, I did seek him. The word says that no one can come to the Father unless he's drawn to him. It also clearly states that God wants no one to perish, not even one person. He lays out the opportunity for everybody, but not everybody's going to choose him. And so, looking at Paul's life here in Acts chapter 9 and, and previous, his life leading up to this, he, he wanted to do what pleased God. But what he was doing wasn't pleasing God. He wanted to, but he wasn't. And because of the way that he was brought up, and the, in the traditions that he was brought up in, and the teaching and, and all that stuff, it was understandable that he would act the way that he would act. That he would try to destroy anyone that believed that Christ was the Messiah because he didn't believe that Christ was the Messiah. And, and all of the religious leaders at the time, the main religious leaders, said this isn't the Messiah. He didn't come the way that they thought that he was going to come. He didn't accomplish the things that, that they thought that he would accomplish, right? At least in their own mind, the way that they perceived what he was going to actually do. Sometimes the way we think things are supposed to happen aren't really the way things are supposed to happen because we serve a God that His ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are not like our thoughts. They're so much higher. So Paul experiences this firsthand and gets a, an interesting meeting with Jesus. I love it. But what he does is he goes out and he tries to he doesn't just try to, he does get the actual um, approval for him to go bring these people that are, uh, they literally, they're not hurting anybody. They're only helping people. They've done nothing to hurt anyone other than claim that this person who claimed to be God, they're actually making that claim too. But if you look at everything else that they do, they're not going out and, and doing things that what we would today believe would justify being imprisoned, tortured, murdered, all of those things. They weren't. But this one thing that they were doing, they considered to be blasphemy. And they wanted to kill them. So he gets the approval from these religious leaders. And I did a little bit more research. Um, Last time I was up here, I think it was Acts chapter uh, 7, I was talking to you and told you that I thought that it was probably Caiaphas that was the, the religious leader, like the high priest of the time, and he was the actual high priest of the time, at least all the, the scholars believe so. And in December of 1990, this is, I, I love history and stuff, so in December of 1990, these, uh, these people were doing some ex uh, excavation and stuff, and they actually discovered in Jerusalem this uh, bone box. It's, it's what they call an ossuary. And it was essentially a bone box, and it had an inscription on it, and it said that it was Caiaphas, and they positively dated it to that time period. And so it is super cool. It is super cool because... We have like tombs of, they, they are pretty positive. They know exactly where King David was, where King Saul was, multiple different kings. They, they, they can pinpoint where those are. But right now, as of today, I, I was just checking, double checking before I came in here this morning that this is the only um, 
bones or ashes of a specific person mentioned in the New Testament that has actually been discovered to date. Now, we're getting, we're getting so many things that are being uncovered in, in Jerusalem and, and all over the Middle East. I mean, it's just constant. They are finding things that absolutely prove the Bible, absolutely prove it, all the time. It is so neat, man. I just, I love it. It just, it lights me up. But now I want to mention uh, where it says the way. It says he was asking for their cooperation in the arrest of any followers of the way. I love that name. I absolutely love that name because, one, it was the earliest name for the Christian movement. And if you think about the way, it's used, it's used five times here in Acts, but it's used uh, consistently. And, and here shortly, we're going to see that the term Christians were first used in Antioch. But right now, they're constantly calling it the way. And Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life, right? And so these followers of Christ, everybody else is calling this, this movement the way. And it is the way. It's the true way. It's the only way. Following Jesus was a way of living as well as believing. Because these people dedicated everything. Like now, they were going this way. Now they're going this way. So I just, I don't know. I think it's really neat. But then it says, As he was approaching Damascus on this mission, a light from heaven suddenly shone down around him. He fell on the ground and heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Can you fathom that? Like, they didn't have super bright flashlights. They, they never saw any kind of a light that even closely resembled the sun. But this light, radiated so brightly. It was so bright. And, and Saul here, he's just, he's freaking out, man. He's straight freaking out. He sees this bright light. He hears this voice. And, it, you know, a lot of us, we don't oftentimes hear this audible voice. We want to, don't we? I want to. It's like, God, just tell me, like, with an audible voice, exactly what you want me to do, where you want me to, I'll do it, just, just tell me. And he does tell us, but he tells us in different ways. We don't all get to experience this heavenly voice. He's never seen or heard of, experienced anything like this. Well, he had heard of God talking to people, talking to the prophets and stuff of old, but he had never experienced it. And in fact, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the religious leaders didn't believe that God even talked to people like that anymore. They literally, because it hadn't happened for quite some time, over 400 years, it hadn't happened. And so they believed because God hadn't done something in this amount of time that He's not going to do it again. He's done doing that. Have you ever heard people say that? That was for then. That was, that's not for now. God doesn't move like that now. Oh, so you took God and you put Him over here in your little box so that you can control the Creator of the world. Is that what you're telling me? So that he only does things that make sense to you? That's craziness. That is absolute insanity. It's God. He can do what he wants, when he wants, where he wants, how he wants. So, 400 years pass, and boom. He's talking to Saul on this road. Man, I find that super awesome. In Acts 22, verse 6, Paul revealed that this happened at midday. When the sun shines at its brightest, yet Paul said that this light was brighter than the sun. That's a pretty bright light. <laughs> Have you ever looked into the sun at midday? I don't recommend it. But he sees this, this light. And you know, we have these, um, these people that think that Paul fell off of a horse on his way to Damascus. A horse or a donkey. Like if you see painters, they, they paint these scenes and like he, he falls off this horse. It doesn't mention that anywhere in the Bible. Nowhere. Out of all the different accounts 
I thought I had them listed out. Maybe I don't. There's multiple different accounts that are told of this trip to Damascus. There's no horse or donkey mentioned anywhere. So I just, I don't know. I find it interesting that people kind of scatter in what they want whenever they want. But so I thought I'd throw that out there. When, look what, what Jesus says. He says, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And then Saul asked him a question. In my Bible, in this translation, New Living Translation, it only says one question. In a lot of uh, translations, it actually has another question. In mine, it says, who are you, Lord? Saul asks. He calls him Lord because he recognizes the power coming from this, this person, this entity, so he immediately shows reverence. He falls to the ground. Wouldn't you fall to the ground too? Like, it wasn't bowing down and paying homage. He's scared to death. There's a power that's in my presence, and I'm in its presence right now, and it can do all these things. It could clearly kill me instantly. He was scared to death. I guarantee you, that's why, bam, he hit the ground. I don't know if you've ever been that scared. I have once or twice. Like, you want to get down, get, find some cover. There's no cover Saul can go to to keep him safe here. God met him where he is. He'll meet you where you are. There's nowhere you can go, nowhere to get away from him. He was scared, but God's plan for him was good. It was good. Now, he later says that Saul's going to have to suffer for God's namesake, for Jesus' namesake. He's going to have to suffer, but ultimately his plan for him was to prosper him, to give him a hope and a future, because where he was, he had no hope. He had no future. He was lost. There's only one way to the Father, and that's through Jesus Christ, and he was denying him. So, Jesus goes on and tells him, he says, I'm Jesus, the one who you are persecuting. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. So um, there's another version, uh, other translations of the Bible that don't just say, who are you, Lord? It says, who are you, Lord? What do you want me to do? Whether there was only one question or two, whatever. But if there was two, that second question makes a whole lot of sense. You're here. You're meeting me. Who are you, and what do you want me to do? (laughs) Because I'm ready to do it, whatever it is, right? The voice replied, the voice replies, I am Jesus. Well, there was a lot of people named Jesus in those days. He wasn't the very first one, but Saul knew exactly what Jesus this was. There was no question about it. No other Jesus was this Jesus. And Saul probably sat on the Sanhedrin, and he probably cast his vote against Jesus to put him on that cross. It wasn't very much earlier than this. He knows exactly who he's talking to. So he says, I'm Jesus, the one you're persecuting. So Jesus points out his sin, makes it clear, this is what you're doing. I don't want you to do it anymore. And he's like, you got it. I, okay, yeah, that sounds good. I won't do that anymore. So then if he did ask, what do you want me to do? Even if he didn't ask, Jesus knows. And he says, now get up, because you're still down in the dirt, and go into the city that he was going to, and you will be told what you must do. He didn't tell him right then, Anything else that he wanted him to do. He told him, get up and go into the city. Then you'll be told what to do. He gave him the next step. He didn't give him the big picture. He didn't tell him, hey, get up, go into the city. You're going to get saved. You're going to get filled with the Holy Spirit. Then you're going to, you know, people are going to be trying to kill you just like they tried to kill me, just like you're trying to kill people. And then you're going to go through all these hard times. You're going to get bit by a snake. You're going to shake it off. You're going to get shipwrecked. You're going to get beat several times, stoned. You're going to get... You know, ultimately, you're going to Caesar, and he's going to cut your head off. He didn't tell him all that, because Paul would be like, ah, you know, maybe there's some other way we can go about this. 
He didn't. He just gave him the next step. Does he ever just give you the next step? He just gives me the next step. And then I'm wondering, I'm like, well, God, what do you want me to do? He's like, I want you to do what I told you to do that you haven't done yet. I don't know, maybe that's just me. The men with Saul stood speechless. So he, didn't, he wasn't just going by himself. He's going to arrest lots of people. Men, women, it doesn't matter. If they claim Jesus, they're getting arrested. That takes a lot of people. Lots of people went with him. And it says that these people that were with him stood speechless. For they heard the sound of someone's voice, but saw no one. That would be a little odd, because there wasn't radios. No one's going to be transmitting music. Maybe some, nobody was driving by, you know, like it just, it didn't happen. They're totally freaking out. So they don't see anybody, but they hear something. They didn't even see the bright light. Saul picks himself up off the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he was blind. He was blind. There's this boom, super bright light. If you, have you ever been, anybody ever shined a super bright light in your face? All my kids and my wife have Um, because I've shined bright lights in their faces. But it immediately makes you close your eyes, right? He's holding his eyes closed because this light that's all around him is brighter than the sun in midday. He gets up, and by the time he has the courage to open his eyes, he opens them, and he's blind. Can't see a single thing. All the other guys are just fine, though. Remember whenever Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist, and it says that the Heaven split open, and God spoke, and He said, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Right? Some people didn't hear that. Some people thought there was thunder. Some people heard voices. Other people actually heard what God said. You might be right next to somebody and experience something, and they might not experience the same thing. My Uncle Tim has an awesome testimony about this. This is my uncle... Bald guy looks a lot like me, right? Um, Good to have you here, and you too, Ron. Love you, buddy. He has this testimony of whenever he got baptized. Was was Brother Bradshaw your, uh, was he your father-in-law at the time or not? You were a kid, right? Like 16 or something. 17. He gets baptized, comes up, feels the presence of, of the Holy Spirit just all over him. I mean, he's literally experiencing this. Later, he asked Brother Bradshaw, the pastor, our pastor, he says, did you feel that? And he's like, what? What? I didn't feel that. He's literally standing there being touched by this guy, and the, Brother Bradshaw didn't feel it. God might strategically reach out like a sniper and touch you, but not other people around you to fulfill his purposes, his goals, Right? So that's what happened here with these guys. They heard the voice. They didn't see the light. He opens his eyes. He's blind. So his companions led him by the hand to Damascus. It's it's probably good that he had good friends. You know, they didn't like walk him into a tree or something. But that might have been funny though. But anyway, he remained there blind for three days and did not eat or drink. Three days. He was only given the next step. Go there, and I'm going to tell you. Somebody's going to tell you. He says, you will be told. He didn't say, I'm going to tell you. He says, you'll be told what to do next. He was obedient. He goes. But for three days, he's blind in a place that he's not familiar with. Just met the Messiah on the road who blinded him and confronted him for persecuting him. And he's just sitting there in darkness, waiting. Reminds me of whenever I rolled my mom's 72 Nova whenever I was 13. I've probably told most of you this, but my mom and dad are out fishing all day. I get the car rolled over with help of a farmer. Parked it right back exactly where it was was before. Maybe they won't notice that it's totaled. 
But I had to sit there and wait for them to get home. And I thought, I'm dead. I'm literally, I, life is over. I'm literally physically going to die. Is that, I mean, you know, if you knew, <laughs> I'm like, this is it, man. Saul very well could have been thinking the same thing. I sat there for hours till they got home fishing. I'm like, who fishes this long? Get some fish, you know, let's get this over with. I only had to sit there for like six hours, I think it was. Feels like an eternity when you're sure you're going to die. But uh, he's sitting there for three days in blind silence after meeting the creator of the universe who called him out on persecuting him. So, I, I do think that it's kind of neat, though, that Jesus was in the grave, in the darkness, for three days. I mean, he was busy doing things. But his body was in the grave for three days. And he made Paul, Saul, at the time, wait for three full days. That had to be a humbling experience for somebody that, that was absolutely certain that they were doing the right thing. And then come to find out they weren't. All of his previous ideas of who God was, they had to be seriously challenged. And so if he is this very, very astute learner and teacher of the law, and he believed one way, God's taking these three days to reshape what he thinks, right? Then it says, now there was a believer. This, this word can also be, it is actually translated disciple, in Damascus named Ananias. This is not the same Ananias from Ananias and Sapphira. Totally different. He didn't come back to life. Um, this is a totally different guy. The Lord spoke with him in a vision, calling him Ananias. Ananias is a disciple. He's... He's lear a learner of Jesus. And God, boom, downloads this vision. Some of you get visions. Some of you dream dreams. I usually dream dreams about what God wants or what He's doing or things to help kind of shift the course of, of my actions. Ananias got this vision. We don't know anything else about Ananias other than he was a disciple of Jesus. He was probably an ordinary person since we don't have a whole lot more information on him, right? But God had a special work for him to do. So God knew him, knew that he could trust him to follow through with what he needed him to do. <clears throat> and God spoke to him in a completely different way than he spoke to Saul. In a very short amount of time, we see how God talks in multiple different ways. He can show up and speak to you from a super bright light in an audible voice, or He can speak to you in a vision, or in dreams, or He can impress on your heart through the Holy Spirit things. That's, I mean, He talks in so many different ways to us, but He talks to us in ways that we are going to know and understand who's talking to us. He says, you're my sheep. You hear my voice. You know my voice. Don't let Satan tell you that you don't know God's voice. All you have to do is test it. Does it line up with the Word, or does it, is it contrary to the Word? You know, go to your spiritual leaders, your mentors, and ask them. Spitball it by them. If you're married, go to your other half, or like my other better three quarters, and, and talk with them about it. Like, God will help you to line those things up. But look at what He does. It's, he talks to him totally different in a vision, but he gives him very specifics. He gives him a specific street, a specific house, a specific man, and, and told him exactly what the man was doing. He said, go, go to this man Saul on, over on Straight Street. He's staying at this house. This is what he's been doing. He's been praying to me. God told Saul about Ananias before he told Ananias about Saul. I find that kind of interesting, you know? Especially whenever we break down the dynamic here in a minute. He's telling Saul, somebody that he's having to drastically change, 
This guy is coming to you before he ever even tells Ananias to go to him. I think that's pretty funny. Yes, Lord, he replied. Ananias replied. The Lord said, go over to Straight Street, to the house of Judas. Not Judas that hung himself. Totally different Judas. When you get there, ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul. He's praying to me right now. I have shown him in a vision, so I have shown him, past tense, I have shown him in a vision, a man named Ananias, you sir, coming in and laying hands on him so he can see again. I think that's so funny. Ananias exclaims, but Lord, (laughs) I've heard many people talk about terrible things this man has done to the believers in Jerusalem. And he is authorized by the leading priest to arrest everyone who calls on your name. He's like, God, I've heard things maybe you don't know about. Did you know that this guy actually wants to kill and torture Christians? You probably didn't know that, so this might change things. And Jesus is like, yeah, yeah, I know but I want you to go. And Ananias had to be, think about the things he had to be wrestling with. I want to be obedient to you, God. I want to do what you want me to do. But what you're asking me to do can get me killed. It can get me thrown in jail or in prison. It can get me beat. It can get me tortured. It can get my family killed. Do you even know what people are saying about this guy? Do you know what he's capable of? And Jesus is going, yeah. He killed me. I'm well aware. But I need you to do it. I want you to do it. And I already told him you were coming. So, there is that. But the Lord said, so this is God's response to Ananias whenever he's tripping out and trying to remind God of who Saul is. The Lord said, go. For Saul is my chosen instrument. Think about that. Before we go any farther, God chose an instrument to accomplish His tasks, His purposes, and this dude literally was on the hook for murdering Christians. But he says he's my chosen chosen instrument. I have plans and purposes for this world, and I need and want Him to do it. I've chosen Him. Yes, I understand, Ananias. If it were up to you, you would choose somebody that probably didn't murder Christians. But I have a purpose for Him, and I need you to go anyway. He says, He's my chosen instrument to take my message to the Gentiles, up until this point, Gentiles weren't involved in this. It was just the Jews. Jesus lays this out. I need Him to take my message to the Gentiles and to kings. You're not going to go, but this guy will go, and that's why I'm going to use him. He's going to go take my message to kings as well as to the people of Israel. And here's the kicker. We think having this relationship with God is all all roses, right? It's all a great life. Like you, you lock into this relationship with Him and you will never suffer. You won't have any kind of problems or anything. Eh, that's not the case. He says, and I will show Him, I will show Him personally, how much He must suffer for my name's sake. Saul was persecuting me. And there are consequences to those things. He's going to have to suffer. But Saul will have the backbone enough to continue on even when times get really, really hard. God knows. He knows the beginning from the end. He knows what you will and won't do. What you can and can't do. But you can do all things because He gives you the strength to do it. But He tells him, 
I know how much he must suffer for my namesake. I'm going to show him. So I was, I was looking at disciple, the term disciple versus apostle. And so I just want to lay out the definition because there's a lot of people that, um, that, that don't pick up on the two differences. So whenever you see somebody in the Bible that, calls, that they are called a disciple and then somebody that's called an apostle, there's some differences, okay? An apostle is a messenger or someone who has or who was sent, while a disciple is a student or a learner. So whenever Jesus calls the 12 disciples, they follow him as their rabbi, like as their teacher. And at that point, they were just disciples because they were just learning. They're getting to know everything that they need to know and how to do things and all that stuff. But apostles are primarily people who had met and followed Jesus during his life and were called by him to spread the gospel. Disciples, disciples are simply any of Jesus' followers who, are devoted, who have devoted themselves to learning from him. But the apostles have been sent out by him. Saul didn't spend time learning under Jesus during his time here on earth. But he did have a face-to-face encounter with him. Jesus did speak to him clearly and did start telling him exactly what he wanted him to do. So, Paul is obviously an apostle. So here's what Ananias does. In verse 17, it says, So Ananias went and found Saul. He had to be shaking, you know, like he had to still be questioning what's going on. He says, He laid his hands on him and said, Brother Saul, The Lord Jesus, who appeared to you on the road, has sent me so that you might regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. These are the two things that God called him to do. Give him his sight, have him filled with the Holy Spirit. Instantly, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he regained his sight. He was able to see again. Then he got up and was baptized. Afterwards... He ate some food and regained his strength. I want to encourage everyone in here. We probably all know somebody that we're like, this person's just never, there's no hope. They've done too much. They're too bad. They're they're never going to change. It's been a whole lifetime and they're still not changed. This ought to give you hope that God can reach anybody, no matter where they are, no matter the circumstances or the situation or the decisions that they've made throughout their entire life. I don't care if they're 9 or 90 or 999. It doesn't make any difference. God is God and can reach them and can touch them. And Saul is a phenomenal um, representation of that. And Saul even said in 1 Timothy 1, 13 through 16, Saul says, although I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and an insolent man, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. However, for this reason, I obtained mercy that in me, first Jesus Christ might show all the long suffering. he clearly showed that, as a pattern to those who are going to believe on him for everlasting life. He says, I'm going through these things. I was this way, now I'm this way. I went through all this stuff. I'm going through all this stuff so that it will be an example to people, so that they can learn from that, so that they can have hope from that. I I think that's so neat. So Saul's in Damascus and, and in Jerusalem. Saul stayed with the believers, so with the disciples in Damascus. Damascus must have had this up and coming population. If it took him six days to get there, Like, they had to have had some word that there was a pretty big gathering of of people that followed the way for him to make that his first big stop that we know of, right? But it says that he stayed in Damascus with uh, with the disciples there, the believers there, and immediately he began preaching about Jesus in the synagogue, saying he is indeed the Son of God. Immediately he did this. But he starts preaching in the synagogues. And I think that that's important for us to understand because the synagogues 
These religious leaders are the ones that are persecuting people uh, of the way. But what did Jesus tell Ananias? He said that I've got to use him as my instrument to go to all these people and to the Jews. So he starts out there. And because he, he was a Jew, is a Jew, right? And he's learned, he has an open door to be able to go in and, and speak under their uh, laws and their traditions at the time. If you had these requirements, you could go and actually speak in the synagogues. And so that's what he was doing. And he starts preaching that Jesus is the Son of God. But he was so learned. Let's look at verse 21 and 22. It says, all who heard him were amazed. They're like, wait a minute. Isn't this the same man who caused such devastation among Jesus' followers in Jerusalem? That's got to be the same guy, they asked. And didn't he come here to arrest them and take them in chains to the leading priests? They had to be very, very confused about what's going on here. They're like, this dude is the most vicious person that we possibly have in our sect to, to oppose these people, and now he's standing here trying to say that Jesus is the Messiah? Saul's preaching became more and more powerful and the Jews in Damascus couldn't refute his proofs that Jesus was indeed the Messiah. He proved beyond the shadow of a doubt that Jesus was the Messiah through the teachings, through what he was taught and trained. He can lay it out. Jesus can be proved all through the Old Testament. And Saul at this point starts doing it. He easily proved it. After a while, some of the Jews plotted together to kill him. Uh-oh, the hunter becomes the hunted. The table has turned on Paul now, Saul. They were watching for him day and night at the city gate so they could murder him. But Saul was told about their plot. So during the night, some of the other believers lowered him in a large basket through an opening in the city wall. That's some good friends right there. The law's coming. you got to get out of town. And they literally sneak him out in the middle of the night. He was coming into this town with letters signed by the high priest to kill Christians, to get them, round them up, chain them, and take them back to Jerusalem. And before he leaves the town, he's being lowered out because they're coming after him. That's, what, that's how dramatic of a change. Learning who God is, who he truly is, and accepting him as yours, that's a dramatic change. So, they're wanting to basically send him back to uh, Tarsus for a little while to... Wait for this stuff to calm down. And Tarsus was located, it, it is located right now in modern day Turkey, close to where um, Natasha, we call her Paige, Benke, she's one of our um, missionaries. She works with Free Burma Rangers over in the Middle East, um, taking the word of God to the Muslim world. And she's just this little white girl that is in one of the most dangerous places on the planet for a little white girl to be. But God's still protecting her. It's pretty amazing. But Saul is literally going real close to where she is right now. And it was the capital of the ancient prof, uh, province of Cilicia. It's located near the eastern Mediterranean coast today, and it's about 10 miles inland from the sea. So he's going back there from Damascus. Then it, it, it says, after many days had passed, right? So I want to put into some context what the many days had passed talks about. He was, let me read 26 and 27 real quick. So when Saul arrived in Jerusalem, no, before he goes to Jerusalem, he leaves um, Damascus, goes to Tarsus, and then it's, it talks about how long he was gone, but it doesn't make it very clear right here. But if you look in Galatians 1, 13 through 18, Paul explained more about what happened during these 
many days during this time frame between the time that he left Damascus, went to Tarsus, and before he goes back to Jerusalem. Uh, it's, it literally explains how he went out to the Araba for a period of time and then returned to Damascus. After he returns to Damascus, he went to Jerusalem. Paul spent a total of three years in Damascus and Arabia. And that gets pointed out in Galatians 1, 18. So sometimes if we want to get a broad, if we want to get a more full picture of what was going on at any specific time, we have to take places from all over the Word and put them together to get a, a more broad picture because this is just one letter that Dr. Luke is writing. He doesn't get into great detail about everything, but if you start grabbing the, the details from multiple places, you can put a pretty clear picture together. So then when Saul arrived in Jerusalem, he tried to meet with the believers, but they were all afraid of him. Yeah, I would imagine. They did not believe he had truly become a believer. So guys, these are people that are literally, they're filled with the Holy Spirit. He goes back into Jerusalem. It's talking about the disciples and the apostles. And they didn't believe that he was actually converted. Because a lot of people tried to, tried to convince them that they, had, that they were now a Christian just so that they could infiltrate into their group so that they could tell people the, the leading Christian or the, the Pharisees and Sadducees where they were. We see the same thing time and time again across the world today. And, and even look at, um, look at Germany, right? Whenever the Jews were being persecuted during the Holocaust. You see the way that the enemy tries to weave his web and, and slide into places so that then they can turn on them, right? So that they can, they can more easily get them. It's not, it shouldn't surprise us that Satan's willing to lie and deceive us. But even the disciples, they didn't believe that, that Saul had been changed. And it says, Then Barnabas brought him to the apostles and told them how Saul had seen the Lord on the way to Damascus and how the Lord had spoken to Saul. He also told them that Saul had preached boldly in the name of Jesus in Damascus. Thank God for people like Ananias that are willing to come, put their life on the line, to minister to people that need to hear the word. And thank God for people like Barnabas that are willing to pave the way for somebody. When other people don't believe about, don't believe in you. Sometimes it takes somebody that they, they trust, they respect to say, hey, listen, Nathan's not who he once was. He's a totally different dude. It's okay. It's okay. It says, so Saul stayed with the apostles and went all around Jerusalem with them, preaching boldly in the name of the Lord. He debated with some Greek-speaking or Hellenistic Jews, but they tried to murder him. <laughs> when the believers, the disciples, heard about this, they took him down to Caesarea and sent him away to Tarsus in his hometown. So, it had to take a significant amount of guts for Saul to go back into Jerusalem too, because he knew that what he was testifying about now, what he's experienced, has killed several people and will probably kill him too. He's like, I know how it goes. I was the one getting people. I totally get it. But he went anyway because God told him to go anyway. And so he was obedient. God desires our obedience over sacrifice. Somewhere between 8 and 12 years had passed in the life of Saul before he again entered into prominent ministry. So before he came back to Damascus and then ultimately went to Jerusalem, it was about 8 to 12 years. But he was being sent out as a missionary from the church in Antioch. Missions work is extremely important. And we can be missionaries right where we are. Okay? All God requires is that we be obedient. So if He's asking you to affect your area of influence, then affect that area of influence. You're going to be able to reach people that I can't reach. I'm going to be able to reach people you can't reach. But when God says go, then go. Like we're, we're getting ready to do this um, Adopt-A-Street initiative. 
You know, and I'm sure that that makes some people anxious. It probably makes some people fearful. Because you know that just like Saul, you're going to be going out into a mission field, which just happens to be Harrisonville, the people that we live right here around, that we're around all the time. He didn't tell us to go wherever. We get to go right here, but we, we know by the state of the world that we live in that we may face opposition. However, it's not likely that we're going to be handcuffed and taken to prison for it yet, you know? But what are we concerned about? What are we worried about? What causes us worry and anxiety and fear? It's the unknown. It's not knowing how people are going to respond to us. It's not knowing how God's going to work through us, how He's going to operate with people through us. But guys, all we have to do is give Him the opportunity to do it and then watch Him work. He just says, go. Go, and I'll take care of it. I love how it says, so the amount of time that had passed, several religious leaders had changed post. The, um, even the Roman rulers had changed post. And so the church then had peace throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria. It says, and it became stronger as the believers lived in the fear of the Lord. And with the encouragement of the Holy Spirit, it also grew in numbers. So, something Rod talked about last week. In verse 31 here, it says that it had peace throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria. Jesus gave them the the command to go to Judea, Galilee, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth, is what He told them. And now it's laying out very clearly that these places had peace because they finally became obedient after Stephen's murder. It kind of split people everywhere and set them out of their comfort zone, but then God brought peace after they were obedient. So now now we're kind of wrapping up Saul, and it moves on to Peter. Everybody remembers Peter, right? Peter's kind of a wild child, but Peter is the rock that God will build His church on. So Peter also, at this point, has been moving in miraculous power, doing wild and crazy signs and wonders and all kinds of cool stuff. It says, Meanwhile, so while these things were going on with with Saul, Peter traveled from place to place, and he came down to visit the believers in the town of Lydda. There he met a man named Aeneas, who had been paralyzed and bedridden for eight years. So whenever Peter comes in contact with this guy, I'm not saying for sure, but I would assume that what he's seeing in his his mind, in his memory, he's probably remembering Jesus meeting the paralytic next to the pool of Bethesda, right? He's probably remembering what Jesus did at that point where he tells him, rise up, take your mat, and go home, take your bed and leave. So when he meets this guy, he was paralyzed and bedridden for eight years. Peter said to him, Aeneas, Jesus Christ heals you. He didn't say, I'm going to heal you. He put the glory where the glory was due and says, Jesus Christ heals you. And he says, get up, roll up your mat, your sleeping mat. And he was healed instantly. What I think is pretty cool is that God already planned to heal this guy. God's purpose and plan was for this man to be healed, but he didn't do it until Peter was obedient and did what he believed God was telling him to do through the Holy Spirit. If Peter wouldn't have said anything to him, guess what? The dude would have stayed there crippled. It took him being obedient and stepping out and doing what God told him to do. Some people's lives won't be changed if you're not obedient. Some people's healing, some people's relationship with Christ depends on you being obedient. I know that may seem like a lot of weight on your shoulders, but it's not. He says, cast your cares and your burdens on me and take on my yoke because it's light. It's easy to carry. Guys, just be obedient. He'll take care of the rest. 
but just understand that other people, their lives may depend on you being obedient and doing what He tells you to do. It says that, And He was instantly healed. Then the whole population of Lydda and Sharon, which was right there, saw Aeneas walking around, and they turned to the Lord. Isn't that interesting? This healing wasn't just for this crippled guy. This healing was to show that I am the God of all creation, and I can do what I choose to do. This healing wasn't about Peter and the power that God used through him. This healing was specifically so that people would see no other way could this be done except through a God that created the universe. And they turned to the Lord. If God operates through you, through prophecy, or healing, or any other signs and miracles and wonders, it's not for you. It's for Him to get glory and to draw people to Himself. You know how I said that no one can come to the Father unless they're drawn? God can work things through you to draw people to Himself. He can use you to do that drawing. Isn't that awesome? We get to take part in this. I love it. It's amazing. There was a blast or there was a believer in Joppa named Tabitha, which in Greek means Dorcas. Not uh, this is not a derogatory term. It just means deer. Tabitha, Dorcas, they both mean deer. And she was a sweet person. So I don't know why we call people Dorcas, but anyway, this one was really sweet. And it says, about this time, she became ill and died. So the time that Peter was over there and healed this guy, this girl is, is getting sick and she dies. Her body was washed. It was prepared for burial and laid in an upstairs room. But the believers had heard that Peter was nearby at Lydda. So they sent two men to beg him, please come as soon as possible. We don't know if these people expected for... Uh, for Peter to actually lay hands on her and raise her from the dead? We don't know. Because so far, none of the disciples, no apostles, has God worked in raising someone else from the dead. This is the first big one. Up until now, only Jesus did it. But remember whenever Jesus sent out His, his disciples? He said, go, heal the sick, raise the dead. Cast out demons. He told them to do all these things. But up until this point, they had it. But don't you know that Jesus knew they were going to? He knew He was going to work these miracles through them. And so He tells them that. Up until now, Peter hadn't done it himself, but he saw Jesus do it. So he knew it could be done. And so he didn't have to reinvent the wheel. He just did exactly what he saw Jesus do. It said she was always doing kind things for others and helping the poor. We should remember that. Doing kind things for others and helping the poor, no matter your circumstances or situation. we got to love people. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love others as yourself. If you want help, help people. About this time, she became ill and died. Her body was washed for burial and laid in an upstairs room. But the believers heard that he was there. Sorry, I already read all that. And they asked him to come as soon as possible. So Peter turned, uh, returned with them. And as soon as he arrived, they took him to the upstairs room. What do you think was going through Peter's mind at this point? You know, he sees Lazarus raised from the dead. He sees the little girl that was um, the religious leader's uh, daughter raised from the dead. He sees multiple people raised from the dead. He sees Jesus raised from the dead. And he's probably going, is this... Is this it? Is this the time? Like, God, is this what you want to do? And God's probably ministering to him through this point. When he gets there, it says, The room was filled with widows who were weeping and, and showing him the coats and other clothes that Dorcas had made for them. They were upset. Like, they lost a very dear and near friend who was very sweet to them. And it hurt. It hurts to lose people close to you. It hurts. But Peter asked them all to leave the room. Remember whenever Jesus sent everybody out of the room for the little girl that was the religious leader's daughter? He sends them all out. And they're like, 
they start giving him a hard time. He's like, she's just sleeping. And they're giving him a hard time. He says, get out. Get out of this room. And makes them all leave. So Peter's like, I remember he made everybody leave. I'm not saying that that's always going to be the case. But he made them leave. And then he knelt and prayed. He didn't say, I walked with Jesus. It's no big deal. I can do this. And immediately go into it. No. He sought the only one with the power who can raise the dead. He got down on his knees and he prayed. Just like whenever Jesus healed multiple people, we saw him. He looked, lots of times in the Word it says, he looked to heaven and said, Father, thank you for hearing my prayers. And then he got the peace. The Holy Spirit said, now's the time. And he said, be healed. And they were healed. He would speak to it. And, and it changed, right? So he gets down on his knees and he turns to God, who's the only, the author and perfecter of power in his faith. He prays. And then it says, turning to the body, he said, Tabitha, get up. Or in the actual um, language, it's Tabitha, kumi. He spoke to her. Your words have power. They can change things. Words have power. Be willing to speak it out. Even when you don't see the results yet. He's speaking to a dead person. But he knows he's got to speak it out. And he says, Tabitha, get up. And she opened her eyes. Yeah! <laughs> that had to be absolutely outstanding. She opened her eyes. When she saw Peter, she sat up. She's probably like, who is this dude in this room? <laughs> he gave her his hand and helped her up. Then he called in the widows and all the believers, and he presented her to them alive. Some versions say that he called everyone in, especially the widows. You know, because... She was so important to them. And he presented her to them alive. He said, this is what my God can do. This is what God does. That's super powerful, man. It doesn't get any wilder than that. But I want you to understand there's a difference here, okay? She wasn't resurrected. She was revived to her old life. There's a big difference, okay? And I know that, that we think, oh, she was resurrected, back to life. No, resurrected is you will rise in the resurrection and go be with God. This woman still died after this. She was resurrected to this physical life. Lazarus still died. Isn't that weird to wrap your head around? That even whenever Jesus called Lazarus out, he lived and then he died again. You would think that they'd just live forever if Jesus called them out. That's not the way it goes, though, right? And we have to trust that sometimes when we call somebody out, if they don't come back to life, that's not your fault. God has a purpose and plan. Some people do come back to life. We would think we just saw um, Stephen be murdered, right? full of faith, an amazing Christian, an amazing apostle, amazing teacher. You know that if he was still there, God would change the world with this dude. But he didn't come back. But Tabitha did. Some people do. Some people don't. I've laid hands on dead people and prayed for them to come back. But they haven't. That doesn't mean I'm not ever going to do it again. Because it's not up to me. God just says, do it. I prayed for this lady over in, where was I, Scotland or something like that. She's in a wheelchair. And I'm like, I'm scared to death, guys. Like my heart's, D -d 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 I'm scared to death, but I know I'm supposed to go pray for her. Her son is pushing her around in the wheelchair. I get up there and I'm like, can I pray for you for healing? And her son gets all kinds of mad. 
He's like, you Christians. You blah, 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 blah. I mean, just ripping me up one side and down the other. And I'm trying to ignore this dude and just talk to her because she's the one, right? And she's like, yes, and he's all kinds of upset that I'm, that I'm even considering this. That I'm like, my God can get her out of this chair. So I put my hands on her and I pray for her to rise up, to walk. And she does it. And I'm like, what? I was so sure. But God has had my wife and I pray for other people. And we have seen crazy healings. Sometimes he does, sometimes he doesn't, but I'm not God. I don't get to make that decision. If it were up to me, I'd go, I'd do nothing but go into hospitals and heal everybody and I'd put the medical industry out of business. That would be super cool. I think it would be super cool. Might not be, I don't know. But he just calls us to be obedient. Just be obedient. I do encourage you to ask the Holy Spirit if he does want you to pray for somebody. Because even Jesus walked by a lot of people and never healed them. Lots of people. But he presented her to them alive. And verse 42 and 43 says, The news spread throughout the whole town, and many believers in the Lord, and, and many believed in the Lord. And Peter stayed a long time in Joppa, living with Simon a tanner of hides. You might hit that last verse and just smoke over it like, okay, so he, uh, he tanned leather. What's the big deal? Come to find out, this means a whole lot more than just what you read on the surface level. Peter was a Jewish man. And according to the Jewish customs, he couldn't be around, even around somebody that touched dead animals. Yet he lived with a man, that his job was to touch dead animals. So we're seeing a shift in Peter at this point. A shift from just another step of God showing him. And it was at Simon's... I don't want to steal next week's thunder. But it was at this dude's house that God gives him a vision of the sheep being lowered down with all these different kinds of unclean animals. And says, take and eat. And he's like... No way! But he's living with a dude. He's living with a guy that according to their laws and customs is absolutely not legal. Not legal. That's a pretty interesting verse, really, if you think about it. And it's easy to remember whose house it was because he was Simon and now he's Peter and Peter's living with Simon. But, anyways, I probably ought to wrap it up. So, that is Acts chapter 9. Next week, Rod will be jumping into Acts chapter 10. My beautiful wife and I will be down in Houston um, celebrating a friend of ours' birthday. So I will miss you guys next week. But I hope you have an amazing week. And please remember uh, that we are doing the Adopt-A-Street initiative. There are people here that, um, that we get to share a relationship with Jesus Christ with. We get that opportunity. But I want to encourage you, even if you're not part of this initiative, if you want to be, come and see us. There's plenty of room. I'd really love to have some of you available to do that. And, um, But I want you to remember, guys, you don't just have to be going out on an Adopt-A-Street initiative to share the love of Jesus with everyone you meet. That is truly what we're called to do. And this life... Very, very short. We only have a teeny tiny amount of time to truly show people the love of Christ. So please remember, no matter what you're doing, to love God and to love others. Represent Him well. That's what you're called to do. If you guys uh, want prayer for anything whatsoever, healing, salvation, anything, feel free to come up. We'd love to pray with you all. We will have one more song. If you want to stay and worship, you can. If you need to leave, go ahead. Um, we love you guys, and we hope you have an awesome week.